Hi, welcome to another edition of This Issue. My guest this time is Shenna Bellows, who's the Executive Director of the Maine Civil Liberties Union. Shenna, w welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I'm glad to, be here. to have you here. Before we get started, I want to make an announcement about a very important upcoming event. Uh, on uh, Tuesday, March 11th, from 6 to 9 p.m., in Portland at the Rhines Auditorium at the Portland Public Library. There's going to be a public forum on U.S. military and foreign policy where you'll have a chance to hear from the congressional district uh, number one, uh, the first congressional district candidates, the people running for Tom Allen's seat. Uh, that will include Michael Brennan, Adam Coat, Cody, uh, Mark Lawrence, Shelley Pingree, and Ethan Strimling. They're all going to be there. This is an event being sponsored by 12 different organizations throughout the uh, 1st Congressional District, including Maine Veterans for Peace, uh, Greater Brunswick Peaceworks, and the University of uh, Southern Maine Department of Sociology. So again, that's Tuesday, March 11th at the Rhines uh, Auditorium at the Portland Public Library, 6 to 9 p.m., a candidate's forum on U.S. foreign and military policy. Well, now to the show. Uh, we're going to talk about civil liberties today with Shenna. Uh, first, Shenna, tell us a little bit about the MCLU. The Maine Civil Liberties Union is a membership-based organization where we have about 3,600 members. We are the main affiliate of the National American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. And we do work in three main areas. Um, we litigate. The ACLU has brought more cases before the Supreme Court than any other entity. Um, except the U.S. government, and uh, we work in state legislatures and in the Congress on issues of civil liberties. Our mission is defense of the Bill of Rights. And then our third uh, sort of piece of what we do is public education. Here in Maine, we go out into the schools, we talk about the Bill of Rights and what that means. Um, we do speaking in the community. So. All right. You're staying very busy in these days, aren't you? Extraordinarily busy. Yeah. Uh, you recently, just within the last 10 days or so, had an uh, op-ed piece in the uh, Brunswick Times record, and it began with these words, anyone who thought our civil liberties problems would disappear when control of Congress switched from Republican to Democrat has experienced a rude awakening. What exactly were you talking about in this uh, piece? Many people thought that perhaps when control of Congress switched to the Democrats that one would see a restoration of our civil liberties because we've seen tremendous abuses of power since September 11th, um, infringement on our civil liberties in a variety of areas, including surveillance, uh, the torture of detainees in our custody in Guantanamo, Iraq, and Afghanistan, uh, the elimination of habeas corpus for uh, detainees in Guantanamo. And so there, there was some hope that um, if, if we weren't able to restore our civil liberties, that we certainly wouldn't see any further infringement. And unfortunately, we've been sadly disappointed. Uh, Congress hastily passed the so-called Protect America Act in August of 2007 uh, in response to the Bush administration's plea to legalize the National Security Agency's warrantless surveillance program of U.S. citizens. And you know, these revelations came out about two years ago that the Bush administration and the National Security Agency, in collaboration with telecommunications companies like Verizon and AT&T, uh, have begun to monitor internet and telephone communications of potentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Americans without going to a court to get permission first. And that this surveillance took the place of um, data mining those communications, but also warrantless wiretapping to actually monitor conversations and communications on a real-time basis with no court order. Uh, initially, the rhetoric from Congress was very strong that this was unacceptable, that the Bush administration had gone too far, but then we saw a capitulation. Um, the Bush administration uh, came and asked Congress to legalize the program, and they did so on a temporary six-month basis that they passed in August in about a week's time with very little debate. Now we're at a situation um, where Congress is going back to the Protect America Act. And again, the rhetoric has been, we'll restore civil liberties. In fact, the House passed a, a version that they're calling the Restore Act. But what this act does, what they're looking to do is again 
um, allow for warrantless surveillance of international communications of Americans. So I, who did the Peace Corps in Panama, when communicating with my friends and former host family in Panama, my communications are not free from surveillance. Uh, anyone who's communicating with people in different countries so for whatever that, reason. A lot of people would say that's not a problem. You know, I don't have a problem with that because I'm not doing anything wrong. Uh, why do you have a problem with that? The Fourth Amendment guarantees our freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, that we're secure in our persons and our property, and by extension, our communications. In a democracy, it is important that, that our individual communications, our thoughts, um, be private from government interference unless we're suspected of criminal activity. And so this is fundamental to who we are as a people, this security to be able to have conversations. Because what happens is if people think that the government is listening in, they begin to censor themselves. And that's um, detrimental, I think, to freedom of thought and freedom of expression. Well, tell us more about the NSA, the National Security Administration. They use computers and satellites and they have bases around the world where they are downloading essentially uh, communications. They've been spying on the people of Europe and Asia for years with this stuff, but now they're beginning to use NSA space technology basically to spy on the American people. It's important to draw the distinction between the NSA and organizations like the FBI. The NSA is purely an intelligence gathering organization. That means they have been spying for years, as you say, on individuals in other countries to collect information about governments who would do us harm or foreign agents who would do Americans harm. Uh, the FBI, their purview has traditionally been domestic and ostensibly, although they've definitely violated this several times throughout our history, is supposed to be gathering information pertaining specifically to criminal activity, actual suspicion of wrongdoing. Uh, so suddenly to have an intelligence agency which doesn't have those limitations, which just collects wholesale huge amounts of information. Like a have, vacuum cleaner almost, just exactly. su sucking in everything. Exactly. To have their attention focused not outward on other governments who might have reason to do us harm, but focused inward on the American people whom they're supposed to serve uh, is very disturbing. And they don't have the same limitations on the information that they collect um, that organizations like the FBI, whose purview has been traditionally domestic, might have. Do you think the American people are really concerned about this, or do you think they just don't know that much about it? I think it depends on who you talk to. I have been encouraged by the response of Mainers um, regarding around this issue. Uh, when the revelations broke that the telecommunications companies have been complicit in simply handing over information and making their facilities available for this warrantless surveillance without asking um, for a court order, without asking the government any questions. Um, here in Maine, a group of citizens brought a complaint to the Maine Public Utilities Commission, uh, which oversees the um, utilities in Maine. Uh, Doug Cowie led the complaint. He had worked for the Public Utilities Commission for 18 years, and he wrote a series of letters to Verizon asking them to confirm that his information hadn't been turned over to the NSA. Uh, when Verizon did not respond to him, um, he and 21 other citizens here in Maine brought this complaint to the Maine Public Utilities Commission. And the Maine Public Utilities Commission uh, initiated an inquiry. They asked Verizon to respond to the complaint, uh, when Verizon supplied them with some press releases that seemed to indicate that they had not participated in the program, but refused in its legal documents to confirm or deny their participation, the Public Utilities Commission asked Verizon to produce an officer to swear under oath that they had not uh, divulged Maynard's private information to the federal government without a court order. And at that point, the federal government stepped in and sued the state of Maine to prevent the inquiry from going forward, to prevent any further investigation. But why I've been so um, encouraged, if you will, is about 400 Mainers sent um, letters, petitions, uh, joined the complaint before the Maine Public Utilities Commission. And furthermore, as this legislation is being considered before Congress that would vastly expand the NSA's ability to do this, that would essentially legalize what we're talking about. 
um, again, the response from Mainers has been significant. Um, a variety, you know, 108 lawyers signed an open letter to Senators Snow and Collins that was printed in the Portland Press Herald. Um, they've been receiving, we've been visiting their offices every day to talk to them, and we've had um, a variety of members joining us to do that. And how do our two senators come down on this the telecom immunity, uh, this new bill? Uh, both Senator Snow and Collins um, have now voted twice um, to uh, move legislation forward that would um, put in the law immunity to the telecommunications companies for having violated the law previously. They both support telecom immunity. Um, Senator Snow spoke on the floor um, and expressed her support for the National Security Agency's warrantless surveillance program. Um, we're dismayed to hear that, um, very dismayed. In your op-ed, you also, uh, and when talking about this issue, you, you named Democratic Senators Rockefeller and Reed as being also instrumental in pushing this telecom immunity forward. What's going on with them? Well, this is particularly infuriating because in September of 2006, um, a bill containing telecom immunity came before the Congress and was rejected immediately. They realized they didn't have the votes to pass it and it disappeared. Uh, so what changed between September 2006 and uh, January 2008? Well, the Democrats did win control of Congress and both Senators Reed and Rockefeller have been the recipients of major contributions from the telecommunications companies. And suddenly, Senator Rockefeller is the chief architect of the Bush administration's legislation to um, put in law protections for the NSA to conduct warrantless surveillance and the telecom immunity bill. Do you think it's just a matter of the of the contra campaign contributions that is driving that or is there something else driving that? What's your sense of that? I honestly don't know. I wish I did um, because our elected officials take an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment is clear. It explicitly um, sets out the right for us to be safe in our persons and property from unreasonable search and seizure. Uh, why the senators are afraid of courts um, having weighing in on the constitutionality of this program is beyond me. Because what we're, what we're talking about, and the telecoms have said we're going to be bankrupt if you allow these lawsuits to go forward. But let's be clear, uh, here in Maine, the citizens that brought this complaint are not asking for monetary damages. What they're asking for is a review of the constitutionality of the program. What we hope is that the courts will rule this program is unconstitutional. It's not okay for the government to listen in on our phone calls or review our emails without um, suspicion that so we're doing anything really wrong. So you're not really asking for a penalty, you're asking for a remedy in a way. That's right. We're asking for what's called an injunction, which is when the courts um, say uh, to the parties that are sued and to the government, this activity is unconstitutional, it can no longer occur. Yeah. Um, so why, you know, if the administration and the Congress is so secure that this program meets constitutional muster, then why, don't, why, why won't they let the lawsuits move forward um, to wait and see what the courts say? Yeah. How about our two uh, main uh, members of the House, mm -hmm. Allen and Mishu, how have they uh, helped on this issue? Have they spoken out, calling on the, uh, on, on the senators, uh, the Democratic senators, Reed and Rockefeller, have they called on them publicly to back off? I have not seen any public calls on Senator Reid and Rockefeller to stop this bill and, and really the issue is in the Senate right now because the House passed similar legislation that does not include the telecom immunity. Now both representatives Allen and Mishu did vote against the so-called Protect America Act in August. This hasty legislation, this six-month authorization basically allowing the Bush administration and the NSA to do whatever they wanted. Um, they did vote against that legislation and we applaud them for doing so. Um, I do think though that there, it's, it's a really important time if Senators Reed and Rockefeller um, aren't being responsive to the Constitution, perhaps they would be responsive to the internal politics. And I think it's, it's time for House members uh, like Representatives Allen and Mishu to stand up and call on the Senate um, to stop telecom immunity. Yeah. And, and, and to demand fixes for the legislation. Um, we have put a lot of emphasis on telecom immunity because we have faith still in the courts and we are hoping that these proceedings that we have initiated will be able to um, reach resolution in the courts. 
Um, but equally important is a provision in the Senate bill that allows the government to monitor the international communications um, of everyone. The, the legislation explicitly says that if the NSA is going to target United States citizens, then they must go to the secret Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court for authorization. But if they are, have an international target and U.S. citizens are merely incidental to that, then they do not need to go to the court. And unfortunately, written in that authorization is specification that they don't have to specify who is to be targeted or where, where they are going to place the um, surveillance if it's international. So as written, this creates a giant loophole. Basically, the NSA can monitor any international communications it wants without going to the court. You know, one thing I'm concerned about is a lot of people uh, listening to this show in, in general think that many of us uh, are just Republican haters and Bush bashers and all that kind of thing, and, and that we're never critical of the uh, Democratic leadership. And I think in this particular case, it's another example where the Democratic, or a lot of the Democratic leadership anyway, the, in this case some of the top Democratic leadership, is very much taken the position of the Bush administration. So for us to have credibility with the public, I think we have to also be able to name names of the Democrats that are carrying the water for the Bush administration in this particular situation. Let's go to another one of the very important issues that's happening right now in the House of Representatives, they passed the Homegrown Terrorism Act, and it's now in a Senate committee. People are calling it the Thought Crimes Bill. Uh, what does that mean? What, what is that about? This is a bill, and it's, it's utterly ridiculous. Both Representative Mishu and Representative Allen voted for it, as did almost all of the House members, and it creates a, a, a study. It funds... It <laughs> funds above a million dollars, I can't remember the exact amount, um, a study of homegrown terrorism and violent ideology. And the reason we're concerned is specifically the language that identifies this sort of violent ideology um, or ideologically based um, violence. And again, criminal activity is criminal activity, and there are laws that pro prohibit that. Um, whether that criminal activity is motivated, um, whatever thoughts it might be motivated by, are really irrelevant um, to target. And what we're concerned about is this, this study is going to, in its construction, target peace protests, people who are against the war in Iraq. Um, so they're who, beginning to redefine violence or terrorism as uh, opposing your government or speaking out against your government. They're in essential, are they kind of legally reframing the, the definitions of terrorism to include a person, a nonviolent peace activist like me? Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, I think, again, the bill is written so vaguely that everyone thought that they could vote for it. But even to create this study that then, by its formation, by its structure, focuses attention on those um, who may be in a minority but who do oppose the policies of the government in power. Um, is of grave concern to us. And we've seen this time and time again. You know, when the USA Patriot Act passed, overwhelmingly, they created a new definition of terrorism, um, which was so broad that we thought it would likely include um, protesters engaged in legitimate civil disobedience acts like Greenpeace and other organizations of that ilk who engage in civil disobedience to make their point. And sure enough, we began to see, after passage of the Patriot Act, um, harassment of the government um, of, of these groups, of people for the ethical treatment of animals, of Greenpeace. And then more locally, you saw in the Maine State Legislature, um, I think it was two years ago, this trying to define terrorism as environmental terrorism and, and suggesting that civil disobedience um, in defense of one's environmental beliefs uh, was terrorism. So I think that the, the definition of terrorism has become um, so overbroad uh, that it's really being used um, by the current Justice down Department critics. to shut down critics and to cast a chilling effect. Because if you think that you might be subject to government scrutiny if you were to join a peace protest in Monument Square or an anti-torture protest um, or a protest against you know, whatever it might be, then you're less likely to speak out. You're less likely to voice your opinion. Nationally, has the ACLU seen a, an increase since the Patriot Act's passage? 
have we seen an increase in infiltration of uh, peace groups and other groups and other political groups, nonviolent political groups? To me, that's the real essence of it. Are we seeing an increase in uh, monitoring, surveillance? Absolutely. Uh, um, you know, separate from the Patriot Act, just after September 11th, John Ashcroft changed the rules under which the FBI uh, conducts surveillance, the inter internal FBI spying guidelines, and to allow the FBI basically to attend any open meeting and to, you know, conduct surveillance on any group that was engaged in first, traditionally First Amendment protected activity. Uh, so the, the ACLU conducted a Freedom of Information Act request on behalf of a variety of groups, including, I believe, your group. Um, and here in Maine, we, we conducted, we participated in the same Freedom of Information Act request on behalf of groups like the Eastern Maine Coalition for Peace and Justice. Um, we actually had to litigate to receive results from that request. And what we found was extraordinarily disturbing. Uh, since September 11th, the FBI has collected tens of thousands of pages of information in a file on the ACLU. Now, we are media hungry. Everything that we do is very open. We operate in the courts, and we operate in the legislature, and in the court of public opinion. For the FBI to waste its time monitoring the activities of the ACLU when we're in the newspaper almost every day is, is just an utterly ridiculous. And then we found that indeed that they had opened a file, that they'd intercepted an email communication um, from the Eastern Maine Coalition for Peace and Justice. Again, for the FBI to waste its time on uh, peace activists here in Maine really is disturbing. When there are real people who would do us harm, when there are real threats in the world, um, for them to be pushing paper. Uh, and how do they justify those uh, those surveillances, those, uh, how, how does the uh, FBI justify that publicly? What do they say? I don't know if I'm the best spokesperson for the FBI, but my understanding is, uh, or it, it comes from this philosophy of trust us, we're the government, and we need to be ever watchful. Um, you know, it's connected to this, you know, the there was a program that Congress did shut down, although it seems to keep creeping back. Um, this surveillance program, you know, John Poindexter had envisioned for the Pentagon this uh, program by which you know neighbors would call in tips that they would have this total information awareness system, this giant database of everything about everyone, centralized in one in one single place. Um, I think that's the government's attitude, that the more information, the better. If we know everything that everyone in the United States is doing, then we'll be able to stop terrorism. Isn't that what we used to say about the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, that they were like that and that we were better than them because we weren't like that? Exactly. These are the tools that repressive regimes throughout history have used to subjugate their citizenry. And for us to voluntarily give up our freedoms after September 11th, to me that means that the terrorists have won. Let's move to, we only have a few minutes left, let's move to the real ID. They're talking about uh, establishing a national ID card. Uh, tell us about that. I think this is a backdoor attempt to implement total information awareness. Uh, requiring a national identity card where information, uh, personal information about everyone in the United States is so stored in a centralized system, um, and then requiring that for people to get on a plane or enter a federal building or move about society, that they have to have a national ID card that has, as a requirement under the law, tracking technology. Now, it hasn't yet been determined technologically whether that's going to be a swipe card, a magnetic strip that one swipes, or a radio frequency identification chip embedded in the card that would allow for the government to engage in real-time tracking of any individual that it wanted to track. Um, this is extraordinarily disturbing from a privacy perspective. And then from a bureaucracy perspective, do we really, can we afford as a nation to implement this extraordinarily costly system? Um, can we afford from an, this is sort of an identity thieves wildest dream. You know, you put all the information in a single place, uh, it becomes very a easy um, mm -hmm. for uh, a terrorist or just a plain old run-of-the-mill identity thief to hack into the system or to access the system 
through a malicious or indifferent or ignorant bureaucrat who has access to the system. I've seen uh, on television over the last few years references of chips implanted in people. I remember one time one of the, uh, actually 60 Minutes did a story about uh, a mother who had voluntarily said they wanted to have this chip implanted in their child. Uh, so, you know, uh, m many p people have been talking about this idea that they would even, at some point, uh, besides putting a chip in a national ID card, maybe when, uh, in the future, that when children were born, they would put a chip in them. Uh, isn't that really uh, something that we should be worried about? The technology exists to do these things that were once considered to be science fiction and completely implausible. Um, the world that George Orwell um, wrote about uh, was technologically impossible when he was writing. It is no longer technologically impossible for the government to monitor the movements of the citizenry, um, to track people in this way through a chip or otherwise. Um, so what is left is our philosophy and our responsibility as a people, our system of laws, our rule of law, and the Constitution. And if we do not enforce the Constitution, if we do not demand that our elected officials uphold and defend the Constitution, then we are left with our worst nightmare. Well, spooky. It is. It's frightening. But there is hope. Um, so I do what believe... do we do? What do people do? The people listening to this show... How do we, when, let's, let's be honest, we, we've got a significant number of Democrats that are voting the same way as Republicans on this stuff. How do the people then affect this incredible uh, ship that is on this course to take away our rights, our civil liberties? How do we affect that? Get involved. Um, I, be specific if you I would. think voting matters. That's the, the very smallest thing that you can do. But even more than that, I think communicating with elected officials matters. I think that in Maine, um, we are lucky that we still have access to our elected officials, to our congressional delegation. We can still meet with them. Um, the Internet has been a tremendously powerful force. We've defeated telecom immunity. We defeated it before Christmas when Chris Dodd started his filibuster. We defeated it again um, Monday, uh, January 28th. Um, it will come up for a vote again, and that's what's discouraging. Um, but the reason it was delayed and momentarily defeated was because the Internet had mustered so many thousands of calls to Reed, to Rockefeller, to the Democrats who were squishy on this, to the Republicans, uh, including Snow and Collins, who were uh, obdurate on this. And, and the pressure was such that they felt that they couldn't pass the legislation at that time. Now, they've delayed it 15 days, probably in hopes that people will not pay attention anymore. Uh, writing letters to the editor, um, voicing your opinion in the media, um, providing a counter, uh, counter opinion, if you will, a, a countervailing ideology and reminding people about the importance of the Constitution, and talking to family and friends. Uh, we live in such a world, there's so much information, there's so much going on, it can be overwhelming. Um, but we need to get informed share that information, and then get engaged. And if we don't like what elected officials are doing, we should run for office ourselves. Um, so Very good. Well, Shanna Bellows, thank you very much for coming thank on you. the show. And thank you for watching another edition of this issue. Until next time, good luck to you all, and please get organized.